In this video, I want to talk about how the rise of the National Socialist Party in Germany affected the Brüderhof and describe how the pressures put on the community by the Nazi government eventually forced them to flee Germany. When German President Hindenburg appointed Adolf Hitler Chancellor in January 1933, it was an ominous signal to the members of the Ruhrnbrüderhof that life as they knew it was about to change drastically. Because of their communal way of life, and at this time there were around 100 people, including children, living at the Ruhrn, and because of their pacifist convictions, they anticipated antagonism from the authorities. In what they heard of Hitler's speeches and the new decrees and legislative changes that were rapidly put in place, it felt to them as if war had been declared against all they stood for. But from shorthand notes of the communal meetings held at that time, it's clear that they were determined to continue living as an oasis of sanity, as an embassy of the Kingdom of God within Nazi Germany as long as they could. I'll just read one excerpt from a meeting. This is Arno Martin, a 27-year-old agriculturalist. When such a mass of people are ready to submit their whole will to a satanic power, how much more must we be enthusiastic, courageous, and on fire for God's cause, for the cause that really has a future? Here's another quote from Anna Marie Vester, a 24-year-old kindergarten teacher. Listening to Hitler's speech, I felt as though we were an embassy in another country with a quite different language and a quite different atmosphere. The testimony of this, our alien land, must come through so clearly that it really will be heard. The Bruderhof learned later in that year that a plebiscite or referendum was scheduled for November 12, 1933. Every German was required to sign a ballot confirming his or her support of Hitler's policies. Eberhard Arnold, as the Bruderhof representative, met with the local governor to ask what would happen if community members refused to participate or voted no. He was told that it would mean concentration camp. As a matter of conscience, the community members felt they could not vote yes. So instead, on the day of the plebiscite, every member of the community wrote out a statement and pasted it on the ballot sheet. The statement said, my conviction and will bid me stand for the gospel and the discipleship of Jesus Christ, for the coming kingdom of God, and for the love and unity of his church. That is the calling God has given to me as mine. In this faith I intercede before God and all men for my people, their fatherland, and the government, the task of government being another and different calling. Of course, this didn't go over well, and four days later, the community was stormed by 150 uniformed men, SS, local police, and Gestapo. Some of the community's young men were lined up against a wall and searched for weapons. When nothing was found, they were herded into the carpentry shop and guarded by armed men. The women and children were detained elsewhere. Here's a description from one of the members, Kurt Zimmerman, a recently married 25-year-old carpenter. November 16th came, a gray, dull autumn day. My wife, Mariana, had gone to the school, and I was on my way to the carpentry shop. As I passed the meadow house, I heard voices, and as I looked toward the hill, I spied a whole crowd of SS men, and among them, rural constables. Near the farmyard, a group of shouting SS men came storming down the hill. I turned quickly and ran back to the main yard. I knocked on the window of the schoolroom where Mariana was teaching and said to her, I want to say goodbye quickly. It might not be possible later. Suddenly, the community was swarming with SS men, and they occupied all the houses. I think we would have fared badly if the constables hadn't prevented the SS from exceeding their bounds. During the raid, the community was searched. Beds stripped, dressers emptied, floorboards ripped up. Men and women were interrogated. Miraculously, what diffused the situation was a piece of furniture. While they were searching Eberhard and Emmy Arnold's apartment, the chief inspector recognized the von Hollander coat of arms on a chest. Emmy's maiden name was von Hollander. It turned out that the inspector had been a student of Emmy's father and held him in such high regard that he called an end to the search and the men left shortly thereafter. 
At the end of the year, the government revoked the community's permission to run a private school. Rather than accept a Nazi teacher, the children of school age were sent out of Germany by the community and situated at a summer hotel high in the mountains of the independent principality of Liechtenstein. This became a second community known as the Alm. Most likely because the Bruderhof had friends in England and America, the Nazis at first did nothing overt against the community, but they did find other more subtle ways to try and drive the community out of the country. They forbade them to sell any of their produce, taking away an important source of cash revenue. Then they took away the foster children the Bruderhof had taken in and forbade the community to offer hospitality to guests. These restrictions were an enormous blow to the community's outreach efforts. In March 1935, military conscription was introduced in Germany. Immediately, the young men of military age at the Ruhr Bruderhof all of whom were pacifists because of their faith, fled to the Alm Bruderhof in Liechtenstein, some on bikes and some by train. A year later, they had to flee again as Liechtenstein could no longer protect them from the arm of the German government. This time they made their way to England, passing through Switzerland and France and across the Channel. At that time, a third Bruderhof was started in England in the Cotswold region, but it became increasingly difficult to maintain three places simultaneously. With most of the men out of Germany, the members that remained at the Rhone could hardly keep the farm going. The only real income they had came from the sale of books they published and handcrafted bowls and other items. On April 14, 1937, the Rhone Bruderhof was again surrounded by the Gestapo. Once more, all members were herded into the dining room and the Gestapo chief read out an announcement. The Bruderhof in Germany was dissolved. Members had 24 hours to disperse. The three members of the Bruderhof Executive Committee were taken to prison for further questioning. But the Bruderhof members refused to be scattered. They were able to emigrate to Holland, where they were taken in by Mennonite friends until they could do the necessary paperwork to enter England. The three men in prison were eventually released and also made it to England. Although the Bruderhof was forced to abandon the oldest and most beloved community, the members soon set about building up a new settlement, convinced that God would continue to care and provide for them. And, in fact, a surprising number of guests began to arrive, many young people for whom another war was anathema and who wished to demonstrate with their lives that fellowship and goodwill could exist between people of different nations. But that's the story of the Cotswold Bruderhof.